The planet Earth has been relegated to backwater status and among the planets of the solar system. Its long golden age of peace and prosperity has ended under ill omens. Long dormant tensions have re-emerged among the remaining human population of Earth. The feudal world state government of the ruling von Straub and Imperium presides over the turmoil in the areas of the planet where civilization still exists. A Japanese emperor rules as a figurehead over the planet. To survive the political intrigues in this age, the emperor took an American wife so he could heal the von Straub and Imperium. He wooed this young American to be his wife with three gifts. These gifts were the creation of great inland sea in Kansas, the building of a great palace for her rule in, and the capturing of an asteroid named Ceres as of Earth's second moon. This last gift had great consequences for the planet Earth. The gravitational influence of Ceres played a devastating role. It created new seasons of global weather that threatened to bring extinction. Saris became known as a harbinger of change, and humanity too felt itself suspect to the changes. But it came with celebration as humanity gazed into the heavens to witness a great change between the girl and their hearts. They left their homes to travel to the Sea of Kansas to answer the call of the young American empress who wanted to breathe new life back on the dying husk of the planet. The call was answered. Thousands of pilgrims died along the way by the oppression of the Earth's real masters, the Occupy Incorporated. Nonetheless, the pilgrims came defying corporate law. This is a story about four pilgrims who dared to make that journey. Sailor crossed the hen hunter infested atolls of the California archipelago. He was careful to avoid the nearby port city of Viva Las Vegas. He was all too aware of the consequences of encountering each of these threats. He had lived a life on the seas of the Pacific. His life was like an old tattered map, and the experiences of his life had weathered holes into it. Behind him was the specter of life he had once lived and now existed no more. This made his face and who he was unobservable to all of those who encountered him in fallen California. He was a failed hero as wanting of a new life to replace the one he had lost. He was a stranger in a land of his ancestors. He was the last sailor. The last sailor's wooden canoe grounded itself on the alkaline shores of the Utah coastline. He'd arrived in the kingdom of Deseret, a rogue state of people grounded in religious theocracy and the simpler insurances of community. It was a place that was observant to the angels of heaven and to make good with these forces of heaven which looked over them. The elders of Deseret quickly took in the stranger from the sea and gave him a place to eat and rest. The elders of Deseret then gave up their God-fearing advice to the Gentile who had come from the sea. And the last sailor listened to them as they said to, Beware of the brotherhood of the dark knights of Moroni, who had left their mother church as saints and had become rebel angels in pursuit of holy war. All across America, they had turned the ground into graveyards. The last sailor was gracious for their help, but he did not stay. The next morning, he crossed the Wasatch Range alone again into the Rocky Mountains. As he traveled in the cold mountains, he remembered the memories of his past life, a life lived on the seas of the Pacific. His life had really started there, formed by the pull of tight ropes as he had hoisted up the sails of the ships that had become the landmarks of legend. He could remember every port of call, the names and the faces of these people, as they belonged to the greatest fleet of ships on the oceans of the planet. They had been called the 500 Strong, and its travails across the Pacific and all its islands 
have been a storied, constant journey. But the last sailor remembered bitterly. Curse was the life of all adventurers, and doom was the sagas of all heroes by the fates of the gods. His life had become one of torment, and the deities of the cold blue ocean depths had forsaken him. peaks of the Rocky Mountains in old Hispanic Colorado. Here on the backbone of the continent, where the ancient citadels of Sojourner would dwell the centuries-old tribes of women in monasteries complete with the worship and devotion to the deity they call the horned goddess of the triune. They pray daily to the lunar cycles of the moon, the Earth's original moon, Luna, huntress of the night. The tribes of women return to the same cycles of life that were within the holy sepulchres. The last sailor watched us all from afar and guessed that the sight of the Earth's new second moon, Ceres, had inspired these horned women to the great lengths of ritual and worship of the powers of nature. Just as he had felt himself inspired by the sight of Ceres overhead his one-time Pacific seas, he knew that there were vast changes at work within the sills of Sojourner. With Luna full and bright and Ceres resplendent and dark, the last sailor never could have imagined the new ritual that had been inspired by the sight of the new second moon. The tribes of women would welcome return of lost love, whether it be a daughter, a sister, a mother, or in the case of the last sailor, a husband. The last sailor fell asleep under the new moon sky, and in sleep, he began to imagine the strange unknowns that were at work within the citadels of Sojourner. In the beginnings of deep sleep, he had now become part of these priestesses' secret ceremony. He was in their mountains, and now in sleep, he was part of the ceremony that danced around him. He could not escape. He was made to peer deep in the fire of his own mental agony, the agony he tried to put away and forget. Instead, he was projected into this fire, and he saw his tragic drama before him. Like a glyph, his own skull was enstamped with the melancholy of his lost friends, his lost loves. But this pain was transcended by the nature of the magic upon him, and his own inner psychic eye was forced to project itself out from his own consciousness. He traveled out of his own body on a line lit by the power of magic, where the distance of traveling was vast and a brief fade from all realizations. sailor, this tragic hero, now found himself flying over the flattest of lands where endless fields of wheat were underneath him. He saw in the distance a chain of mountains born of torture. He crossed these knife-like mountains and saw beneath him a great sea with calm tidal waves. In front of him was a rock island set in the middle of the sea and on top of the island was a strange looking palace. The last sailor realized that this palace was his destination. His soul sped towards the strange looking island palace until he had reached it. Once there, he next realized he was not alone and there was another person in his soul's presence. He felt that this presence was another soul, just like him. It was a young woman whom he could not see. Bizarrely, not being able to see her did not matter to him. It was her pleading words of worry and despair to become his only vision. Eerily, they became his only concern. The voice familiar was fatigued with tears and the humiliation of straining out to a lover to be held and not judged. I don't mind if we all die. The sound of her voice was the sound of cracking walls of strife. The last sailor heard a great sobbing hiding in the deep communion the young woman speaker had with hysteria. 
where you would have expected to find the approachment of her shy cheek, there was instead the image of what the young woman was talking about. She was talking about her demons. If you leave me, lover, don't think that you will be able to escape the truths of my heart that I have told only to you. At this time, the dark night of my soul, I still need your touch. But more importantly, I need you to listen to the darkness that lies inside of my heart. Tonight, I must know, can you love the ugliness inside of me? The force of her explanation was her very own pain, and the last sailor saw her image for the first time, revealing these secrets of hers with self-induced hemorrhaging. It was a wail of pain on the winds of the dead. There was no one more alone than her. Her visions of inner demons continued. There will be a time when the sun can warm my heart no more. I will grow old and I will be less the regal corpse than anyone else in the world who dies. I will die like everyone else and all my beauty will be gone. I've obsessed upon it my whole life. She sounded sad near death. Gone was all the beauty of her youth. And don't think you can choose the parts you'll get of me. You'll soon see the end of the world and expect to believe they are born of love. Her voice became meek as she ended her talia in her demons. She collapsed weakly in her own self-pitying gravities. At this moment, the gales of the dead went through plains of the ghostly imprints of time. The last sailor called the forever. It had not been since the last days of his old Pacific life that he even felt it. The young woman fell into his arms and he loved her. He knew lo he loved her the same way a child cannot comprehend what it does that makes its parents smile and laugh. His love for her was an intuition. At the moment that the young woman shrieked a pain-wracking plea for him to love her, the last sailor tried to make sense of why he did love her. It was when he invited rationality into his dream that the dream ended and he awoke. The cold Colorado night sky returned overhead in the land of the awake. He was back in the Rocky Mountains where snow-capped peaks were the nurseries of the stars and the Via Lactea, one and the same with the potential to procreate. Of Luna and Saris had set hours ago. The last sailor was dwarfed by the sparkling eternity overhead and all around. He had found the forever, but he was alone within it again. In the meantime, far to the south of Colorado, the spirits of the lands and living and dead dwelt with a far more ancient people than the tribes of one men in the citadels of Sojourner. This was the frontier of the vanished Anasazi. The children of these height mountains danced to spiral Tarantella, the call to action the animals of the high deserts to protect their homes and the folds and peaks of this old sunburnt landscape. The children of the marriage between nature and humanity had guided the heroes of Mexican myth and antiquity past dangers before and people kneeled before them in times of need. This was one of those times of need. For in the land of the Venus Anasazi dwelt the seven golden cities of Cibola, and in the splendor of the Mauritanian towers lived the defenders of its land and its people, now threatened by a new threat from the east, the Lone Star Empire, Texas. The deities of the white deserts and high mountains had guided these protectors of the lands to victory over past tyrants and invaders before, and so they would again. The seven golden cities of Cibola so tall and strong that spires were defiant defensible. They would not fall. In one of the seven cities, where the vortex of a storm raged overhead its spires, there was a direct line between the events of nature and humanity. Here controversy resided and had recently blown in from the Lone Star East. This controversy had a few names. The first name was Treason, and it revolved around the figure of the recent expatriate dissonant artist who had fled away from his native home of Texas. 
this was no ordinary artist. This is the Royal Court Artist of the Waterloo Monarch. The Royal Court Artist of Texas had a title for his position, which was called the Deed. His job and responsibility has been to glorify the Waterloo Monarch of Texas. But this expatriate did not answer the name of Tafid anymore, and here was half the reason why it illegally abandoned the Waterloo capital and fled into the western frontier. His name was Shiloh McKenzie, a young man with talent to burn who was more rock and roller than Rococo state worshipper. He had committed treason and abandoned his royal position because of drastic regards for the safety of his mind and body. With calculated animal action, he had forced the very Countess of Texarkana at Knife Point to help him escape the political maneuverings of the Gellian Ultras, as even more and more sacrificial blood had been poured at the feet of the God State of Texas. Earlier in those dark days of political assassinations, Shiloh had been more bold and led underground movements of radical information to be passed along to the subjects of Texas. The last straw in the eyes of the censors of the Gellian Ultras had been the private portrait he had done comparing the tricolor of the William Robert Kings of Texas to the unpopular image of a California president from classic America. After the death of the final William Robert King of Texas, Shiloh McKenzie had watched a downward spiral of Texas long enough. He relinquished his position as David and became a fugitive in the seven golden cities of Cibola. He had trusted himself to the emptiness of fate. Shiloh could trace the Valley of Darkness as home of Mexican Tejas, a descendant of history. It went back to the creation of the Von Straven Imperium, on the heels of the limited nuclear exchange and the closing of the Great Partition. This had all happened in 2882. In the year 2882, Neo American prints were in my home too. Shiloh recalled the rise of the Gellian Ultras circa 2882. They had taken over the once ceremonial kings of Tejas and turned them into the dynastic line of the autocratic William Robert Kings. These kings had come to Appaloostas heads of a Bonapartist-style religion of bureaucrats, royally designed the gardens of Austin to rule the Waterloo Court as emperors of empire. The state of Texas, no longer called Mexican Tejas, was seen as the throne that God sat down upon. The state became a symbol of worship. State worship began in Texas. It was a lusty affair of sacrifice. The Lone Star was the symbol of a greatness inside the Texas masses. And Hegelian propaganda hammered the ideas of a spirit of the people into all their dreams. Pride bred vanity, a great people filled. Military adventurism resulted, and expansion was the justification if it meant the spread of a great people. this to be his final stop. 
Shiloh's goal was to reach the Sea of Kansas and enter the Palace of Vistenia, the home of the Earth's Empress, who was merely answering her call to create a new human renaissance. This one's a celebration of the new moon of the planet, Ceres, the season bringer. Shiloh McKenzie knew that if he was going to violate incorporated law, he needed the best in ride imaginable to the Sea of Kansas and the Palace of Vistenia. He needed a Coca-Cola neoclassicist. They were the race our Cossacks on the ancient American highways of lore. Unbridled, these masters of the roads knew no masters but the throbs of their octane hearts and the racing overdrives of their firebird engines. They had been the one-time cavalries of the famed von Straben emperors. History recorded that the Coca-Cola neoclassicists have been instrumental in the decisive battle for control of the world state. Such was their legend, recorded for all time in history. Since then, the Coca-Cola neoclassicists lived in their powerful plans, scattered across sacred spaces that were now the haunted relics of America at its most urbane height. The air burned with sonic assaults and heavy metal thunder held bent for leather. Shiloh had known the seven cities were a hot car room for the Coca-Cola neoclassicists. Through the ranks and connections, Shiloh was introduced to a young Coca-Cola neoclassicist, a young girl named Hesia de la Transoxnia, whom the sun seemed to shine on for all time, with a special duty to show the beauty inside and outside of her. For the very forces of heaven and hell seemed to be at peace within the radiance of her beauty, as close to divine and mortality could permit. As she was brash, and the first words from her mouth were the specks of a rebuilt firebird. 4.0 King's Leader, Athenian Petrol V8, 350 Phaetons, it's the fastest war chariot in West Chaos State. She was also a glass half filled, and she was eager to go to the Sea of Kansas and the Palace of Christenia, but she only said this about it. Maybe I want to talk to a little dog named Toto, who knows? Either way, she had agreed to take Shiloh, former court artist of the Lone Star Empire, and now a fugitive, to his destination in the Sea of Kansas. Shiloh tried to make late to the risks they were taking in their strap inside of her war chariot. Well, here we go, hell bent for leather. The road is a spine, and humanity a cold shiver. Has she a flash from the grin of a killer? This is no time to let the good times roll. Let us make way for the sights to come that will save our souls. They were off and running at high altitude desert morning. Has she has firebrand foam that snorted as it left behind the mountains of the Taos frontier. And before they both knew it, they were in the Lone Star Douchey of Oklahoma. Cautious minds were left behind this Texan imperial possession altogether. But it was well known to Hesia that the Cherokee nation had a millennium of hatred for the Texas overlords. The two highway travelers on board an antiquity firebird made their way into the Oklahoma land where armed camps and enemies faced off against each other. These enemies were the Indian nations, resurrected a thousand years ago at the start of America's common realm period. Their enemies on the upswing were the suburban fortresses built only recently during the spread of American revivalism. Shiloh and Hesia were just two more examples of all the opposites and dualities that always made up America. A look inside their minds said that much. Shiloh looked at Hesia and saw what everyone else saw. One of the most beautiful women in the whole world, and a face that set a thousand engines to wail. He told himself he would try to paint a picture of her in a nude once they arrived in the Palace of Christenia, and he laughed inwardly at the childhood fable that anyone who saw a Coca-Cola neoclassicist in a nude was torn to bits by the hounds of hell. Hesia looked at Shiloh and saw what everyone saw in the nobility of Texas. Aristocrats with powdered pink wigs having sex in the royal gardens of the Waterloo capital. No matter his reasons for leaving behind the frolicking decadence of his royal upbringing, and no matter his good intentions to join the eternal renaissance in the Palace of Castenia, he was still accountable for the Lone Star Empire's destruction of her home city on the banks of the Mississippi River, the last symbol of the first thousand-year golden age. They both were gone now, everything golden that had once been touched by the sun. Back to the cold north.
away from the long hot days of the endless sunsets in Oklahoma. The last sailor had been walking for days. He continued the exploration of the land of his ancestors into a place that for centuries had been known as Wyoming, but now politically belonged to the Von Straben Imperium. Today, the last sailor smelled a familiar smell in the air, burning human flesh. He had once smelled enough of it in his past. This was all the convincing he needed to explore the origin of the smell, for heroes are also wise fools. He crawled over a small hill where the scent of burning flesh was strong. Overcome with sickness, he peered into the oblivion. Before him was an overturned semicircle of stones, looked like they had once been an astronomical observatory for pagan rituals, but had recently been turned over in desecration. He soon saw who had done this. The reason was in a smog of burning flesh. It was a cat ringed in laser wire and fences made of steel razors. There were emaciated men, women, and children imprisoned here. They were slaves, and that was the plan. This was a concentration camp, and these people had been brought here to die. Bodies stink of death, where humanity had once dwelt, there was a hole. In that hole, a skull named Atrocity. Before the last sailor could take another breath laced with holocaust, he heard the sound of someone behind him. He slowly turned around. A plasma rifle was pointed at him by a hooded young woman who looked strong and dark. Her tribal dress and uniform was unique, almost military style. She had an insignal patch on the right arm of her parka, and under her hood was a soldier's cap with another pagan insignal patch on it. The last sailor had a good idea who he was dealing with. He responded appropriately and spoke to her. Long live the many faces of God. The last sailor knew she was an engineer, a rare pagan soldierhood who were descended from an older warrior order that had helped build the legendary common realm a thousand years ago. The woman soldier put down her plasma rifle, but she still looked stern. You'd be wise to get out of here, she warned. The tone of her voice had the easy lilt of the simple countryside. We're busy evacuating all our Pagani people away from here, these Christian soldiers. And the engineer spit with hatred and disgust. These Christian devils are too overpowering here. The last sailor then asked a question. Where am I? And a young woman pagan soldier replied, This is the land my people once lived on. But those damn von Straben bastards took these lands. And those murderers of the death camp claim this is a crusader state of Edessa, validated as a Christian nation queen of pagans, my people. The last sailor had had enough of the smell of burning flesh. So who is running those death camps then? The engineer answered, damn Teutonic Knights. She spit again. My name is Janus, and you're my guest. She smiled a country grin. Why don't you come with me? The last sailor shook her hand and agreed, happy to leave this place. They both left together, unknowing of the wounds they both shared. The two strangers to one another left the valley of death in an ancient automobile that stank of putrid heptoline. Janus, the engineer, told the last sailor that this car had been around since the recognition wars. The last sailor doubted that, after all, the recognition wars had happened a thousand years ago on the eve of the breakup of the United States of America. But knowing these pagan engineers and their long history, it was not improbable that Janus was correct. Janus said, my roots go way back to the Bales exiles to Antarctica. My last name is South Cross, named after the Southern Pole Star constellation. They drove north that day. Janus the engineer explained they're heading towards a place called Montana, part of a greater land called Tasia. She explained the history of the land, principally the atomic wasteland of Southern Montana that had been destroyed by a former emperor of the earth. Janus talked about what it meant to her. 
This was once a land of my Pagani ancestors, too. They were destroyed by their own vanity. I'm afraid this has always been the pitfall of my people. After hours of driving through fertile farmland full of the superstitious people of the American countryside, they both arrived at their destination. The last sailor was amazed at what he saw. Built into the mountains was a giant assemblage of stone houses and temples collected around each other into a large mountain community. Janus explained to the last sailor that the settlement was based on high common realm era architecture built by her ancestors a thousand years ago. She said, it's called Communitaria, protected by the dual armies of the red and black banner. The Tejan philosopher kings permit this city to exist in their kingdom. As the two of them walked around the villages of the mini city, the last sailor witnessed the life behind these high common realm era walls. All around the last sailor could see, it was a strange community of diverse people. They lived here in hope for greater human prosperity in an age when uncertainty gripped the planet. Janus told the last sailor that the soul of Communitaria was embodied in an old man named the Monkey Messiah. He was the spiritual leader of a religion that she explained as the wolf who eats the body of God. Janus then cryptically added, it's important that you meet him. And in no time at all, they were dining with the religious leader of Communitaria, the Monkey Messiah. And in the late hours of the feast, it became a drunken orgy of alcohol and screaming monkeys throwing their own feces. The Monkey Messiah recognized the stranger at his table, who of course was the last sailor. He yelled across the table at him. You stranger, tell me what you have seen of my America. How does the wolf eat the body of God in your eyes? Tell me, or my monkeys will shit on you! <laughs> the last sailor nodded at him. Let's get some more drinks poured and then you'll have your cable, monkey man. That was done. And before the last sailor could defend his accounts of what he had seen of America, Janus, the engineer, pagan soldier, and defender of her people, said a prayer underneath her breath. The last seller removed a harmonica from his coat pocket and played the opening bars of an instantly recognizable tune. The song was famous. It was the Star Spangled Banner. He then spoke in a voice comfortable with the powers of storytelling. His voice had an easy gait to it as he began to explain himself. My name is Anacreon Organiman. And in this age of our subjugated planet, under the yoke of the Octopi Incorporated Lords, we see a glimmer of hope in the heavens. In the dual moon of Sky, Luna, and Saris, we see some cause for celebration, but not much. My story begins in America with great loss. I am here because I have nowhere else to go. The days of adventure on the seas of the Pacific are over for me. My friends are dead and the flames of destruction have made a humiliating trophy that my life once was. But my story of loss is not special. It's not more important than anyone else's stories. For in the land of my ancestors, I understand the great pendulums of history have swung back and forth. They say in America, no culture can supersede another culture without some form of resurgence happening here. I pale into importance to all the other injustices in America which need to be corrected, and so I will wait my turn. Anacreon Oregonaman began with the California Archipelago, the first stop he had made in the land of America. I suppose you all have your own fables of Golden California to go along with classic America. I've heard that California is referred to as the Atlantis of America, a place too incredible to be believed, lost forever beneath the ocean during the tribulation, its secrets only myths, and that is all. I can only tell you of what I have seen. Nothing remains of what California used to be.
Ana Creon talked about his next stop, and a place he knew all too well. The waterport city of Viva Las Vegas. Some say that the gold coffers of ancient Las Vegas are the last vestiges of the richness America once had, once was. Some talk about it like it's the proof of a fabled time. What I've seen is a city ready to sell away its own safety for the price of American creature comforts. The pirate mercenary fleets of Viva Las Vegas have been granted port and call in the city as long as they keep the golden life protected for all its citizens. Now, it's a city overrun the very mercenaries hired to protect it. Anna Creon went out to explain the last stop he had made in America. It was Deseret, the religious kingdom and the land also known as Utah. In the house that Brigham built and John saw Lee almost destroyed, there is a gentle prosperity that Moab Stephen saved. It's called the Kingdom of Deseret, Zion, where the green alkaline valleys are hoisted upright by the words of the old Utah saints. Here my canoe first ground ashore, and I like straight into the pounds of the Lion of Judah. When I would have expected a challenge because I was the trespasser, I was instead greeted with assistance. This hospitality came from a people who had repeatedly been persecuted by outsiders. I asked myself, where was their anger? It was then that the winds of debate entered the tale of Anacreon. A draft swept itself from the shoulders of the monkey messiah. He spoke loud and clear. What bothers you is that our Deserite cousins never should have helped your doll, is that right? Anacreon responded. Given I was a stranger, yes. Given again their long history of being persecuted by outsiders, why should they have trusted me? The monkey messiah screeched with laughter. Who said they trusted you, dear sailor? The point is, yes, they as a people have been visited by death, but that also opens them up to life. Being comfortable with the hardships is not closing up oneself. Anna Creon disagreed. Fate is cruel, monkey man. The religious leader of Communitaria screeched. Listen to the twisted branches of my life and hear how more cruel we can be than fate when we fear that imminent death of any kind at the other end of every action we think of taking. When that happens, life doesn't open up, it's closed upon itself, creating the pain of life we see all around us. Janus the engineer, pagan soldier, spoke at this moment. The storyteller is a vessel of blame, unless he accepts his burden as a wise fool. Now tell our guest Anna Creon about the astronaut who fell to Earth. In that instant, more liquors of wildness were poured. The room of astolites and monkeys became excited with the expectancy of hearing the monkey messiah's tale. Obviously, the tale was a popular one among them all. The story began with a reaffirmation of the monkey messiah's life. He gave credit to the deities who haunted over him and all their twisted likenesses to humanity. He then showed every branch which was behind every leaf that the sun warmed with gratitude. The monkey messiah left behind the spirit became the flesh and spoke. I was not always the primate you see before you. I was more like the rest of us now, less than human. I guess it took the wolf to scare me through that door where I gave all the way to fate, just so I could say that it was what I was supposed to let happen to me. The monkey messiah gleamed with religious sarcasm became an old satyr. 
Let us give thanks to the Occupy Incorporated and our beast hungry noble family puppets who both rule our world from higher orbits. Let us give thanks to steel insects they fresh humanity with. Without even a thought to the retribution they held so into the earth, they lowered over with their eightfold eyes. We live in a two-moon era. Saras, the season bringer, is a welcome reminder of the brief interim of tyranny is doomed. We now have a muted empress who sits in ritual subjugation. She sits in nothing more than a kitchen chair. After much ado, the monkey messiah explained his origins. They were incredible, for his earlier life could have been more different than the one he lived that Montana instant. It began in the reformed United States of America, rebuilt on some of the guidelines of the original Federal Union. It had been recreated by the Great Amish Awakening, following the failing of failings, with some major differences. The constitution of the government was not based upon democracy based upon communism. The monkey messiah went on to explain that his prior life had been spent in the Amish homeland of Ohio, one of the Soviet states of the USA. He had served in the army of a political sky named Robert Paul Luke, the young ducal estate marshal of a powerful real estate thief that had become embroiled in a power struggle. Robert Paul Luke's greatest accomplishment in the Amish homeland of Ohio had been the creation of the Twin Towers, a symbol of the ingenuity of the rural people and his real estate thief. The Twin Towers then became the seat of the highest states general, and whoever controlled the real estate feudal council named the attendance of taxation for all of the estates. The Monkey Messiah's memories of Ducal Sire Robert Paul Luke became important here. No one person more embodied the dark age of the planet Earth than R.P. Luke, the Cobra Warlord. As a conscript in this army, I saw him transform into what he is known as today, the Cobra Warlord. I can guarantee he is still the destructive young boy he was when I lived in his estate, cruelly born to be the vengeful spirit in the countryside, and his battle with the forces of the spoilage. real estate thief, instrumental in the popularity of American revivalism and the return of the suburban frontier days of old. Their takeover had resulted in the real estate privilege to live in the glamour of quasi-classic America recreated in the Twin Towers, complete with power steering and full reclining seats. The Monkey Messiah returned with a voice of urgency to his story. As a conscript in R.P. Luke's army on the real estate enemy border, a new world dropped into our laps. We watched in awe as surface to air missiles were fired from the feudal mansion of R.P. Luke. It took a minute for the explosions to be heard due to the miles high elevation that the missiles had flown to hit their target. We strained our eyes to the sky, and seconds later we saw a parachute. Upon closer observation, we saw there was an escape capsule attached to the end of it. We knew full well what it was. The Cobra Warlord had shot down a spacecraft 
has been trying to illegally land on the planet Earth. The next part of the Monkey Messiah's tale was incredible. The garrison of conscripts that he had been stationed with ran over to the escape capsule when it landed nearby. Inside they found a sole astronaut still alive but barely. She was Asian, which meant she was from the outer planets, the home to the expansion of civilization and in the solar system ever since the closing days of the Great Partition. She was barely alive and there was nothing they could do to save her. But as the Monkey Messiah next explained, the astronaut had not wanted to be saved. She told us that she'd already been saved. How? It had to do with the story she told us of her life, lived in the heavens on worlds unlike her own where human civilization had taken great risk in its own evolution. The monkey Messiah to be told the story heard from someone not born in the civilization's predicament. The tale the astronaut fell to Earth becomes symbolic of the death of global humanity and the schism between societies that resulted in the Asian-led exodus in the outer space. Civilization followed the path of other pariahs that attempted to make utopia in outer space. The stars of the night for those on Earth became the places of the day for those in space. But the Earth lost because of the Exodus, the worlds of outer space being. And where villains had rose on the Earth, heroes had triumphed on a hundred new worlds. What the nations of Asia had built in their exile from the Earth was not wasted. The astronaut who fell to Earth had brought them back in a lesson that could never be forgotten. Stravan Imperium, another name in the long scroll of tyranny. Their takeover of the Earth would be heralded by natural cataclysms on the planet. And heralded by supporters of other revivals from the past. To look back on the last glimmer of the golden age was not uncommon. Before the von Strava takeover, many did. the antiquity of nuclear war to finalize the end of peace. The world would come together once more to break apart. A divided world started as an idea from the East. A 
and the West agreed to rule the Earth, while the East would rule outer space. And so explains the backwater status of the Earth in 3001. Everything else comes from outer space, from unknown regions. Humanity's life depends upon the unknown knowledge is laughable when attributed to a human being. First lights of the morning sun cut through the frost of a cold Montana night. In a dark room, the light helped touch up the features of a morning congregation. Anna Creon or Geneman thanked the forever, while Jana Southcross took a position for the Sephiroth. The monkey messiah was his own god. He ate the body of his father and washed him down with coffee. He returned to his story about the astronaut who fell to earth. Furthermore, I blame the stoic decision that's left our world in division. Jaina Southcross, soldier of the Bikani people known as the engineers, spoke aloud. Those who say that the city of man is temporal, but the city of their god is eternal, they have the gods who run whole. They built cities, then empires to the infernal. Anna Creon agreed with what she said, minus her pagan zealotry. Monster up in hell, composer of the world state, wishing well indeed. It seemed convenient to perch on moral swells, also known as Christian hells, while generals in their masses sit like witches at black masses. This land is now led by asses. Far removed from Janus's hatred and Anna Creon's musings, a strange channeling of spirits entered the monkey messiah. He became the astronaut who fell to earth, brought back from the great sleep of the dead, a child of the great partition all the way from the fringes of the solar system, the double planet of Pluto Charon. My name is Tara Stefan. I was from the planet Pluto Charon. Bye. 
fastest spaceship, a sleek hull of elegant gravity. It was all held together in fractions. Increased mass with velocity was destroyed again and again. There was an infinite of me alive for every one of me dead. I lived half a second in oblivion. If you understand oblivion, the name of my ship is the Agamemnon and the curse of heaven upon me. The deceased power of Stefan retold the first successes of her ancestors' colonization of the outer planets. This first step up in Mars. Where not a drop of rain had fallen upon its deserts in a million years. Parasaphon went on to explain that the success of colonizing Mars gave rise for the creation of other settlements on the moons and satellites of the gas giants. At this point, the ghost of Paris Safon went on to explain the beginning of what would become the last voyage of her ship, the Agamemnon. 
The celestial philosophers of Pluto Charon meditated on the Doppler shifts of the light spectrum on the nebulous deep. They waited for the stars to talk to them. From Eon Frozen Charon, the message was brought across the glass bridge of sticks to Pluto. The message was transmitted into the dreams of a specially chosen space messenger. Paris Afon had the honor, and Sarabine monks tutored her the importance of the message she was to carry. You are to travel orbital junction of the earth. There, by the time your ship and you reassemble in their time frame, an important young woman of the earth will be courted by the Japanese emperor of the earth. He will ask her to be his bride. Her decision will rest on the final gift he gives her. This gift will be a second moon for the earth. This moon will be the asteroid Ceres. Go now and escort this asteroid to the earth. Parasaphon boarded her ram collider spaceship, the Agamemnon, en route to the planet Earth. She was prepared to rendezvous with the asteroid Ceres and escort it to the Earth. She was doing this at a point of time when the delivery of Ceres to the Earth was decades into the future, and the Empress to be had not even been born yet. This was the nature of faster than light space travel. Paris Afon lived another possibility of time, just a fraction away, in oblivion. The Agamemnon was flung away from Pluto Charon towards the gas giant planets. First on the order, the blue storm world of Neptune became the source of a diatribe by Paris Safon. She had an affinity for one of the moons of Neptune. This moon was Triton, retrograde satellite with lakes and geysers of liquid nitrogen. Model of the planet Earth. 
And man is not the measure of all things. Instantaneous oblivion and Agamemnon have been flung through the magnetic fields of Uranus. Past the comet world of Chiron and into a swarm of spacecraft that preceded the massive gravity wake that was called Saturn. Saturn harbored the most forms of human and non-human life in the solar system. Human, non-human understood this. There were the Saturnian mystics who meditated with lightness through the storm bulges of the gas giant. There were the floating cities that drifted with the air currents between the floating icebergs the size of the earth. There were the mysterious humans who danced upon the spokes and rims of the rings of Saturn. And societies went even further in these specialized directions. Saturn was a dark place of intrigue. It all culminated in one place. The jewel of Saturn, one of its moons. This was the world of Titan. Intelligent 
aliens and titans frequently use their telepathic abilities to send siren calls across the cerebral radio waves of conscious heaven. They use these telepathic siren calls to look for a cross species base. The titans have done this for millennia, having furthered their evolution by breeding with alien species who have traveled to our solar system eons ago. It has been called life dreaming itself into being. On my last journey in the Agamemnon, I felt the siren call of the Titan. I parked the Agamemnon in orbit above Titan and descended to the surface. I was captivated by a siren of Titan. Parasabon recounted her descent to the surface of the world of Titan and into the cold ethane seas. Beneath the hydrocarbon slush, there had been a special cavern. The nitrogen darkness gave way to luminescence of coral organisms. Paris Afon did not need to see the Titan. She knew it was there watching her. The consummation of the species thus began. And suddenly it ended, and Paris Safan had left the cold cavern, shaking with coital heat. She looked behind her and saw the life glow of her blood child inside the womb of the surrogate coral organisms. For a second, she had looked upon the face of her very own soul. It was a joy of loss Paris Safan would remember forever. and the womb of outer space. The ram collider accelerated the real-time history reality of the ship and my own body. I wrote the possible history while years passed in real time and age matched its own velocity, but I hardly know it. had our non-existent flung towards the king of planets, Jupiter. system of Jupiter's orbiting moons had been in the throes of a holocaust. Paris Stefan's real-time personality was able to understand who was behind this. It was Callisto, first in the order of the four moons of Jupiter, called the Galilean satellites. A migration had happened from the planet Earth called the Secret Declension. The rulers of Callisto were dissenters from the Earth. They were ruled by a devil, the Archduke Vescalibus. People whisper that I'm not human. I'd agree because I don't act like one. What I am is more twisted and stranger, born long ago under a much different sun. What I sleep, demons crawl out from under. 
the gate that holds back my pain. I conceal it well with hate and anger. I wash myself in this bloody rain. When the screaming in my dungeon cease, and the halls of my castle are quiet and still, I prowl with a fear that I can't explain. It's a feeling grown into my will. The walls of my castle hang with human skins. The howls of my prey pound my brain. I, Calibus, am a thousand-year curse. The beast lives upon lands to be washed in the Mad Duke's bloody rain. Straven heirs. Look at my brother and him at me. Look back into the Earth's history. We came from Max's Europe and stole America. Launched an atomic war, but still here we are. How did we fall from ruling Earth in grace? By Lucifer descending, as the Pagani say. We concede to cold blades of Hirohito's war. His assassins cut our throats to rule no more. But look at my brother and him at me. Where we are now is because of cruel history. People talked and people did, so no rulers of Earth could be clones and live. Persephone now saw what she had seen, and the Doppler shifts of heaven were true. With global oceans protected by a shield of ice, Europa glowed with a powerful human presence. This was the matriarchate. They had lived on Europa ever since the secret declension, when their ancestors had been destroyed on the planet Earth. The women survivors had used the last of their power to leave the Earth and colonize Europa. Observe the rules, read the signs. You've entered a domain of excellence, and we can see it in your eyes. Puppy dog tails with rats and snails. That is what you will find here, and you can see in meta-females. Observe the rules. Read the signs. You've entered a domain of reverence, and we can see it in nature's life. Sugar and spice, and everything nice. That is what you will find here, and you can see it under the planet's ice. Why did the matriarchate insist on strict environmental control of Europa? It was because they were guarding a secret. Underneath the protective ice, there was an oasis of deep sea life. Thank you. 
Paris upon next encountered the last of Jupiter's Galilean satellites. This was Io, fire world with sulfur seas of molten fire. These surface conditions ionized the vacuum of space and an aurora was formed of trace atmospheres. This condition was called the pandemonium effect. The trans wave that connected all the world to Jupiter had this to say about Io. It was the wild card. On the surface of the molten world, Paris of Bonds are a gargantuan city that walked on four legs. I am a walking city. I am an industrial supercomputer. I am a metropolis of robots. And other experiments. an Organicon Artificial Intelligence Hive. I am known as the Roman A-double-I-O. I am known as the ruler of this fire world. Controlled from sources times two. Assemblages according to color combinations were lived out through the think tank personalities making up the second silicon RNA showroom. This was the Vulgate Keep, the posterior intelligence hive, where computers dreamed. Parasifon rode the datum quakes of crashing interfaces. She was doing this to communicate with the AIIO. She could have done this by flying down to the walking super city, but she chose not to. Because of the genetically altered army of the Saurians, Parasaphon had great reservations to meet these bizarre alterations of nature.
Instead, she rode another datum column personality. Only once inside, she realized where she was and who she was communicating with. It was a human boy. Paris Afon had met the Prince of Io, and he had much to say. Inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. Your body in the SK system, Your Majesty. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. There will be four heroic people in a land unseen by your eyes. Their lives have not begun yet. They will be born when you die. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. Falling from the sky to the Earth. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. Paris Bond saw the world where all conspiracies originated. She understood that the poison of war would be indiscriminate to whomever stood before its sting. At this moment, Paris Bond felt this poison. The audience with the Prince of Io was over. Paris of Bond had now found herself back at the helm of the Agamemnon. The Agamemnon became a lower frequency to the real-time history of the outer solar system and came about in blue ship wavelengths of the real-time asteroid belt. She came to rest in the orbit of the asteroid Ceres. She had arrived at the exact time when the Japanese Emperor of the Earth would be courting a young American girl to be his wife and Empress. Forty-five years had passed what time had not seemed to move at all. And Paris Afon had traveled years into the real-time future to see the fulfillment of prophecy. She let down her heroic pretenses. The asteroid Ceres had become human territory at the time of the Great Partition. The winner had been the Yamato state of Japan. They had been the only Asian nation to stay on the Earth. By the end of the War of the Assassins and the crowning of Hirohito as Emperor of the Earth, Japan had fully recovered from the limited nuclear exchange. Japan now ruled the von Straven Imperium. Now the Japanese Emperor of the Earth had decided to bring his asteroid Ceres to the planet Earth. To accomplish this, he had to sell his soul to the devil that resided on the red planet of Mars. And these rulers of Mars then sent their hounds of hell upon the asteroid belt.
Parasapon traveled with the asteroid Ceres as the antiquity space shuttle from the planet Earth used hydrogen bombs to blast the orbit of the asteroid Ceres and bring it to the Earth. But as she remembered what the monks of her homeworld had said about the asteroid Ceres, Parasaphon relaxed in the glow of prophecy. Parasaphon went on to describe what she had seen on Mars in the brief time she had orbited the planet. Great changes had taken place in the deserts and glacial fields of Mars. The seeds of life had blown across the dormant fertile crescents of ancient creek beds and volcanic fissures. Coming the green planet. The terraforming process of making the planet more like the Earth had created a vast prosperity sphere. Some places allowed a person to stand in the open air of Mars with nothing more than an oxygen mask. Some places a person could stand without an oxygen mask to breathe in the new Martian air. But I doubted that the rulers of New Mars, the reformed Gnostics, the leaders of the secret declension, were able to breathe in any air of life. Either things that we made will overtake us or take us will take over. The new rulers of Mars, the reformed Gnostics of the Ares, had their origins in a splinter group from the Earth. They had created a society in the carbon dioxide polar fields and lived like perverted lords. In thrones built in triumph to mastery over the human DNA. Each sapient priest had been made a shemale baron to govern worlds in the solar system. A dangerous spirit ahead. If we do not stop, correct, and change some of these wrong They flaunted their belief that they were the temporal representatives of the universe. They used nature as a weapon. The clans of Moses. The blending of the culture of the first Martians and the nations of the Great Partition stood in the way of the reformed Gnostics being lords of Mars. In the canyons of the interior they defended, and in the northern dune fields they stood their ground. But the clans of Moses could not stop the reformed Gnostics. What clans survived the destruction were coward in the surrender and servitude. But that was not the only casualty of the reformed Gnostic takeover. Facing, a, facing, a 
The native life forms of Mars became extinct. Parasophon had no time to react to the attack on her ship. Neither did the other spaceships escorting the asteroid Ceres. The reformed Gnostics had ordered an attack upon them. Their agents of destruction were the Mastiff Raiders from the planet Venus. They fired hyperkinetic slices at every ship within the convoy. They were instantly destroyed. Only crippled. The Agamemnon was made unable to reassemble at a particle level. This was the mortal wound. The Agamemnon would explode and Parasephon would have to escape. That day, above the planet called Mars, survivors of genocide watched the destruction of the Agamemnon. They watched an escape craft eject from an implosion ring that had once been a spaceship. This was the drop tug from the destroyed Agamemnon, heading towards the one planet that Parasephon had never been to, Earth. The lotus of the Cerebid bunks was my Pluto-charred home, calmed my decision. I trusted them, and knew only of nothingness, as I drifted toward the faint gravity well of the Earth. I claimed that my own life was saved, even while my mortality was not, by the knowledge I remembered, the tutoring of the Cerebian monks. I heard the Stygian chants of the pastures between the Cleaver and the Orc. I heard the pulsar songs of red and blue, the colors of heaven. They reminded me that innocence is lost in the presence of life's beauty, but reminded of death when heaven is fulfilled by reunion. What chances will the Earth, lowercase and subjugated, take to follow its heart again? Where Parasaphon's ghost mingled with the land of the living, Parasaphon died once more in Soviet, Ohio, USA. The dead bodies of humanity. That's its only creation. Parasaphon died for a second time in a dark room of communitaria. After the tale the astronaut who fell to Earth was over, Parasaphon left the spirits of the living and returned to the land where her ancestors slept in death. The monkey messiah had been a door between worlds and that door now was closed. He looked around the room. He made eye contact with Anacreon and understood the grief that was inside of his heart. He next made eye contact with Janus and understood the grief inside her heart. They both ate from the same god.
Dion, the last sailor from the seas of the Pacific, had witnessed the death of his own life, and he had found it hard to believe in anything. But he was still alive, and in his old life's death, he had seen his beginning in the land of his ancestors. Creon made sense of the tale in this way. The monkey messiah embodied the spirit of the innocent servant and lived out the mischief with his own free will. All Planet Earth produces is uh, the dead bodies of humanity. That's his own creation. Anacreon had a story to grow in the soil of his past experiences, whether they be the ashes of his past disasters or not. He understood this to be the true gift of life, and so, when the monkey messiah looked over at him and asked him what he would do now, Anacreon said he would live. Live. Next to the last sailor, the Pagani engineer known as Janus said a prayer underneath her breath. The vision she had had days ago about meeting the stranger from the Pacific had said his heart was the biggest gift that her own fate would ever meet. That was all the vision had said. For such was the importance of the last sailor that she was relieved to not know the full plans of heaven for the time being. 